Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Can. Welcome to the very first guest lecture of spring 2022. And these guest lectures are meant to complement the trainee projects. And in the future, we're hoping that trainees and interns can join and ask our best questions. But for our very first lecture, we have our wonderful founding editor, Trish, who's going to talk to us about uh, literary magazines today. So um, jumping right into our first question, um, Trish, could you tell us more about why you started Superstition Review? Um, what was your original vision for the magazine and how has it evolved over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I was recruited uh, to move to the Polytechnic campus to start a creative writing program. And when I wrote the curriculum for the creative writing program that ended up, we weren't able to launch the program itself. <laughs> but um, uh, part of what I wrote into the curriculum was a literary magazine for uh, run by undergraduate students. And I've been, I've been active with literary magazines since I was in high school. I actually worked on the, uh, my library, uh, my county library's literary magazine. I was the editor when I was a senior in high school. So uh, I started very young with an interest in literary magazines. And I really, really wanted to have a magazine that had a strong national presence so that mm -hmm. our undergraduates would have experience with established authors and artists across the country. And so that when they mentioned that they had worked with the magazine uh, in job applications or in uh, you know, graduate school applications, that it would really have meaning. So it was super important to me to have a high quality publication it's interesting, one of my peers from my MFA program in, in creative writing uh, is wanting to start a literary magazine. And wow. I, yeah, and I had a phone call with him last week. And, you know, he said to me, he's like, I, I really want to be able to, um, you know, do everything by myself. I don't want to rely on somebody for the uh, technology, right? Oh. How were you able to... Um, to be able to do it all yourself. And gosh, I, I started making web pages when I, in 1996. So <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. And so, uh, I just, I was really lucky that I had the, uh, the technical know-how to create this product. I, I, and the technical know-how to ask when I needed help. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's ended up working really well. I mean, I could have done a print magazine, but what I love about mm -hmm. the online for, format is that first of all, I get to teach students how to use Drupal and WordPress and HTML. And also I get a lot of comments from contributors who say that they get more feedback about the work that was in Superstition Review than any other journal. Because even though there are print journals that are you know, probably have a, oh, I don't know, a wider circulation, it's mm -hmm. for free. And so, you know, when you can send the link to your extended family, all your friends, you can post yeah. on Twitter. And we actually can drill down how many people entered our site through your unique URL. And right. yeah, and I'll have contributors sometimes ask me, you know, how many people have looked at my page and, and that kind of thing. And it's, it's just so much fun. Whereas, you publish something in a print journal, you never know who reads it. You don't get feedback. Right, that's true. Yeah, it's more accessible as well because anybody anywhere could read it because we have submissions from like all over the world. Yes. So that's really cool. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to share about Superstition Review? Um, no, I just probably that I've had a, so much institutional support um, as you start to study literary magazines. I mean, let's let's say there are a thousand literary magazines. There's probably yeah. more now. They really do ebb and flow though. I've mm -hmm. been, I, I submit my work to literary magazines and I really did a big push on that over winter break. And part of what I do is really research, see what's published, make sure that they're publishing consistently. 
I saw a lot of yeah. magazines that dropped off during COVID. Um, whether, oh, really? Yeah, whether they, you know, it just wasn't the focus or maybe there are institutions that are pulling their support. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we've been really lucky to have had institutional support from ASU for a long time. So uh, that, yeah. that definitely- And I, I think the digital nature of our magazine also helped us because we have so much experience with being online yeah. that um, we had an easier time adapting, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, um, well, you know, I when I was doing the trainee project for literary magazines um, back in that semester, um, I saw that a lot of literary magazines have various staffs. You know, some of them are staffed by um, MFA students, and some have like very professional writers. Um, and like you said, you wanted to create something for undergraduate staff. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think undergraduates bring to the magazine? Hmm. That's such a, a great question. I love that question. And, and I can answer it so well because I've been meeting with undergraduates all these past two days. And yeah. I tell you what, there's a sense of energy. Um, there's a, a pulse, a, a finger on the pulse of contemporary culture. Oh, right. Yeah, no, I think that sometimes um, when someone like me, <laughs> you know, I'm 51 and I've been studying literary magazines since high school and I've mm -hmm. been publishing in them and, you know, running one. I do think that you can become so entrenched in a model that yeah. you don't necessarily try to innovate or, um, follow a, tr follow trends. And I find that my students bring me such wonderful ideas about how mm -hmm. to um, how to curate content, how to use social media to stay in touch with our readership when we're not um, publishing. Because you know we only yeah. have two issues of the magazine a year on the magazine. On the blog, we publish maybe three times a week. Right. And then we use our social media to be in touch with our readership more actively. And I found that um, you, you, undergraduate students come to the work with brilliant ideas, lots of understanding about um, current events and trends. That's great. Yeah, it's so nice how it's reciprocal. You know, the undergrad student, like you said before, um, get to ex exposure to like professional literary world. And then we also contribute very uniquely um, mm -hmm. in terms of like engaging with our audience um, through social media and all that. We do a really good job of social engagement. Um, yeah. So that's wonderful. Um, uh, moving on to our third question, um, literary magazines not only promote themselves, but they also promote one another um, through social media, like um, we talked about. So can you tell us more about the community of literary magazines and how important that is? Yeah, there are a lot of national organizations that uh, keep literary magazines alive, really. Uh, I think about the Council of Literary Magazines and Presses out of New York. Um, they provide grants, they provide mentoring programs, um, registries, things like that, that help literary magazine editors uh, stay current and communicate with uh, peer institutions. Um, there are some too that I listed in the assignment itself. So for instance, newpages.com. I've been a huge fan of them ever since they started. Uh, they do a really, really good job, not only cataloging literary magazines, but also highlighting and reviewing issues. So yeah. uh, I think that's a, um, a great service that they provide. Um, places like uh, the Associated Writers and Writing Programs 
that's a, that's probably the most influential organization for writers, and they have an mm -hmm. annual conference. Um, and at that annual conference, they host a book fair. Um, now, pre-COVID, I think the last pre-COVID event I, tend, I attended had maybe 900 exhibitors at that book fair. And so while that includes big publishers like Pearson or, um, you know, Gray Wolf or uh, Copper Canyon, it also includes a lot of literary magazines. And so one of the fun parts about the book fair at AWP is just walking the aisles, meeting the other editors, seeing their displays, seeing how they're interacting with their readers in their community. It's a great opportunity. Um, I am not going to attend this year. Uh, I didn't attend last year, and I didn't, and I didn't attend the year before, <laughs> all because of COVID. So, right, yeah, maybe 2023, but um, it's it's. It is such, I've, I always took undergrads and they had such an amazing time because, you know, right, it's one thing, I give you this assignment and I say, study these lit mags and you can see their online assets, you can see their, who they're publishing, you can see who runs them, et cetera. But imagine being in a huge, huge convention hall where you, you could spend hours walking and talking to editors handling their journals, um, you know, they hold readings with their contributors, things like that. Such a great opportunity for writers. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, like you said, we're not able to attend in person these past few years, um, but during my trainee semester, mm -hmm. um, they hosted it online and um, through your introduction, I also like attended online and, um, there, they had so many workshops and so many um, writers who were giving the lectures and it was uh, a really cool experience just to hear from those writers. Um, and that's not, that's not even counting, you know, the literary magazines and the book fair you're talking about. So um, yeah, hopefully everything will be back to normal soon. And um, cause that's a really cool experience. Absolutely it is, yeah. Yeah, um, well, literary magazines, um, I think offer something um, special for writers and artists in mm -hmm. terms of um, getting their work out to readers. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you think literary magazines offer to writers and artists that are different from you know, a publishing house mm -hmm. or um, any other uh, source of publishing? You know, I love that question and I teach a graduate level class called literary publishing, where we really examine the difference between publishing in a literary magazine versus publishing in a trade journal, publishing in yeah. a popular magazine. Um, and we talk about self -pub publishing versus having an agent, publishing with a big publishing house, an independent publishing house, things like that. Literary magazines have, traditionally been a way for writers to get, it, it's almost like a peer review process. So yeah. uh, because you are sending your work and sending your work and sending your work, and it's kind of a crapshoot because a lot of, I mean, like SR, we accept anywhere from one to 5% of our submissions. Mm -hmm. And as a writer myself, um, I send submissions and I, I probably have like an 8% publication rate. So mm -hmm. I get rejected more than I get accepted. Um, so a lot of it is a real exercise in the business of being a writer. So authors are mm -hmm. trying, trying and trying to get published in literary magazines. And some of it is good feedback, right? Like if you're sending say you have a short story and you send it out 40 times and it gets rejected 40 mm -hmm. times, then maybe, you know, that's a message to you. <laughs> <laughs> and it could be the message that you're sending it to the wrong types of places. Um, yeah. Or it could be the message that it's not ready yet. So mm -hmm. first of all, uh, literary magazines can provide feedback in the sense that 
whether or not you're being accepted uh, can, can, can hold value. Now, I wouldn't put too much value in it because again, some of it, some editorial decisions are based on, okay, your short story is about um, living on a farm. Maybe the editors just published a story that was set uh, at a, on a farm <laughs> like we don't want to be known as the farm <laughs> uh journal so uh, some of it is just editorial decision making some of it is style I mean style is a big issue and that's one of the reasons that doing that research when submitting is so important so if yeah. if for instance uh somebody writes really traditional narrative poetry and they're sending to a journal that only publishes really uh, innovative, groundbreaking, you know, all over the yeah. place poems, then, you know, you don't, you, you've really narrowed your shot. Um, mm -hmm. I will say that the more publications an author amasses, uh, the, the more likely they are to get into an MFA program or, um, right. You know, sometimes building the bio itself with quality publications, the, like you, if you get your first quality publication and then your second quality publication, that can help you get to the third because a lot of editors yeah. do read bios. They're looking for evidence that somebody takes their writing seriously. And so the, the literary magazine provides um, a way for an author to professionalize and legitimize their work. And yeah. one last thing that a literary magazine presents to an author is a, an audience. So if, if I have a short story um, that I want the world to see, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to get a bunch of people to read your work. If you plug in with uh, a quality journal, then you get a built-in audience. Yeah, that's true. Um, and like you said, the diversity of the literary magazines um, give the writers a lot of options in, um, in terms of where to send their uh, projects. So yeah. um, I think it, it's a good jumping start for them because um, maybe it's sometimes it's daunting to self-publish or send it to a big publishing house, um, starting out with a literary magazine. Um, gives you like a good experience when you're starting out, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, um, I also wanted to ask you, you you've given us some um, organizations that work with literary magazines, but what are some literary magazines that you like to read? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like um, Pank, P -N -K. Okay. Um, that was co-founded by Roxanne Gay. So it's got, um, it's got a nice edge to it. I love Roxanne Gay as an essayist and memoirist and, uh, and as a contemporary thinker. And I think mm -hmm. Pank has done a really good job continuing to recognize voices that are um, really doing some critical analysis, <laughs> oh, cool. but in a, in a creative voice. Mm -hmm. I've always loved the Missouri Review. It's a magazine that I've tried to get into and haven't. I think, yeah, that's one place I have. I've published in about 180 literary magazines. Ooh. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a long career. <laughs> um, and it's funny because I have these dream journals and the Missouri Review is one mm -hmm. and I've never been able to get in, but I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> yeah, no, you will. You will. <laughs> Um, and speaking of dream journals, I recently did, uh, actually it was a couple years ago, get into Crazy Horse. Um, and Crazy Horse is a print magazine that uh, I really, really love. It's, they, it's a square, they do it in a square instead of a rectangular format, really beautifully made. Um, and, and I like it as, a, as an object. Mm. And then I have to say, I have one of my good friends from my MFA program is fiction editor at Copper Nickel, uh, and that's oh. out of UC Denver. And Copper Nickel, and I just beg you to go look at their website because they 
their um, cover art and their their ability to find these just stunning artists for their cover is out of control. And Tej, uh, you know, Tej is the fiction editor. Their their fiction, I feel, is the best of any mm. literary magazine. They publish the best fiction. And I said to Tej once, I was like, how do you get these stories? Like, how, are you writing to people and saying, send me stuff? And he's like, no, they're all from, so, you know, they send in. So I really, I really love Copper Nickel and I'm happy for him. And then can I say one more? I could go on and on, you can tell. <laughs> no, go ahead, share. <laughs> So my first meaningful publication was with the Iowa Review, and that is the uh, literary magazine out of the uh, the first and top MFA program in the country. So the oh. Iowa Writers Workshop, and it's a very difficult market to get into. And I published in that when I was an undergrad. And wow. yeah, just a crazy, crazy. It was a fun story too, because I remember the poem. I, I wrote the poem and it was long. It was a very long poem. And I had very often when I revise poetry, I take out all the line breaks and put them back in again, just to, I, I love to let the poem find its own form. So I had taken out the line breaks and put them back in again, and it, it became a shorter poem. So sent it off to a couple places, sent it to Iowa Review, and I got the acceptance. And so, and I'm a senior, uh, it was my first semester senior year. So, <laughs> and none of my peers were publishing. So it was such a big deal. I mean, everybody made a huge deal of it. Um, but it was so funny because it turned out they paid by the line. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> they paid like $10 a line. And so I think it went from being like a 44 line poem to a 22 line poem. So <laughs> instead of making $45, I made 22. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. I think, um, I mean, for this project, the trainees will get to look at our list that we have on our blog of all the literary magazines. So um, I'm sure they'll enjoy exploring those magazines. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for answering all of my questions for our very first guest lecture. Um, and is there anything else you'd like to add? I would just say, once you find some magazines, I would say, you know, look around a lot. I think Twitter is a great place to start because seeing who is alive and active on Twitter mm -hmm. um, can give you a good clue on, uh, on who really has a staff behind them because that's, true. yeah. I mean, some of the magazines, they, um, they, they're not able to be very active because they don't, have the staff to do that um yeah. and in in covid like i said some of them just dropped away completely so one thing i always like to do when i'm researching is to check out their social media and see have you know when's the last time we've posted what are they posting about like are they um, posting about their contributors are they um giving good news about what their contributors and readers have been doing I really like to see magazines that show strong literary citizenship and yeah. that are engaged and um, that are creating a sense of community. Yeah, that's true. Um, when you go online and you see um, the magazines that you can really tell their personality too. And yeah. it's it just makes like better engagement. You feel more, I mean, as a, I mean, I don't, I haven't submitted, but I feel like if I was a writer who wanted to submit, that's a very welcoming um, atmosphere and you yeah. would feel really encouraged. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's great. And we have two awesome social media managers this semester, so. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yes, they're, so, it's so fun to watch their work. And, yeah. And then to look and see what other magazines are doing because uh, it's, it's good to know best practice. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, okay, well, thank you again. Um, those are all of my questions. And um, trainees and interns, please look forward to the future guest lectures where you guys can join in and ask uh, our guest questions as well. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.